Welcome to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered with Perry Clark. This program looks at mental health from unique perspectives and shows you how to manage your life by finding the knots that help you and stay away from the ones that could be a disadvantage. Now, here is your host, Perry Clark. Hello, all. Welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls and Tethered. I'm Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist here with you. And I want to start with our classic disclaimer that this podcast is for entertainment and education purposes only. This does not constitute working with a licensed mental health professional. And please seek out a mental health professional in your area to work on your unique issues. All right, folks. So this is one that uh, we've had a bunch of scheduling dances on that I'm so pleased to bring you. Uh, this time we're going to be talking uh, with somebody that I was watching during one of our one of the tags, which is the therapeutic applied gaming submits presentations on play and play therapy, uh, especially about certain games, and also has, has their own podcast known as Hero Nation. But this is a subject matter about play and just growing up that I think we also need to know and hear about. So I want to introduce you to our today's guest, which is Sophie and Sark. She, oops, hang on a second. Wrong thing loaded. Give me just a second here. There it is. All right. Uh, Sophie Ansari is a licensed professional clinical counselor, registered play therapist, international speaker, author, educator, and owner of the Let's Play Therapy Institute. She is a leader in positive education who seeks with who works with schools and organizations around the world to build safe, inclusive, strength-based educational settings. She also coordinates wellness programs for displaced refugees and immigrants in Chicago, Illinois. Sophie is known for her work in the incorporating pop culture and video games in therapy through her numerous publications, Comic-Con panels, and media appearances, and also play therapy workshops. She co-hosts Hero Nation, a podcast on the Geek Therapy Network, which celebrates diversity in the media and explores how to use geek therapy, the geeky culture in therapy. Sophie earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in Biology from Wright University and her Master's of Arts in Mental Health Counseling from the University of Cincinnati. You can find more about her on in information at the Let's Play Institute. V- visit letsplaytherapy.org. So, Sophia, welcome to Untying Knots. Thank you so much for having me, Perry. Cool. Uh, so, the uh, first question I saw often asked people is, how did you get here? What is your life story or life experience that brought you not only to being a therapist or maybe brought you to the play, but just what's got you here? Okay, well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. Uh, a long, convoluted sort of path to get me to where I am today, but uh, I wouldn't have done it any other way because I do feel like it is, you know, how I was supposed to get here and makes me who I am and the clinician Mm -hmm. I am. Uh, You know, I, as you had mentioned, I got my degree in biology. And so Mm -hmm. I went into college with the mindset as many Asian Americans and Asians go into thinking they're going to become a doctor. (laughs) So, Mm. So that was sort of um, something that was, I don't know, ingrained, indoctrinated into me since I was a a wee wee toddler, you know, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. And so I went to Wright State University and I got my degree in biology pre-medicine and I graduated with that degree. And then I went into graduate school for anatomy and physiology. And I did a year of that until I just got so burnt out and just realized it just, it wasn't the path for me. It's not that I didn't find it interesting. I found, I found science and the human body and medicine completely fascinating. It's just, I didn't want to dedicate the rest of my life to school, (laughs) Mm -hmm. being in school for so long. And, you know, money was never a motivator or anything like that. Um, It was just, you know, I was going through a lot of other issues as well. And so you know, it, it just wasn't the right fit for me. And I remember in my undergrad program, I had minored in psychology. So I had majored in biology and minored in psychology. And I remember, oh, I just remember looking forward to my psychology classes, to be honest. Like those were the days of the week where I just felt uplifted and motivated and rejuvenated. 
uh, you know, after taking organic chemistry and physics <laughs> and, you know, all these courses throughout the week, just to take a psych course. I don't know. It was just, it was amazing. And I, I remember this one professor, Dr. Gordon, I'll never forget him. And he taught those intro of psych 101, psych 105 courses, you know, the big halls at 300, right. 500 students. And, you know, he really was my first even introduction to, you know, what we might label someone as a geek therapist. And we can talk more about geek mm -hmm. therapy in just a moment. But really what he was doing was using pop culture to explain different psychological concepts and theories, right? Um, and it was like such a brilliant way to connect with, with us, the students, and speak our language, you know, sort of speak, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're watching movies, or he'll use a video game as an example, or a board game. And it just was it was just such a fascinating class, but I learned so much. And, you know, it was always in the back of my head, oh man, psychology, if I do go into medicine, then maybe psychiatry would have been the path, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, it just, uh, I, I did realize, like I said, in that grad program uh, that I just wasn't happy. And so I started exploring other avenues and our um Another school, the University of Cincinnati, which was a couple hours away from me, they had a great mental health counseling program. And so I applied uh, and I got into it and I never looked back. I mean, it was the the greatest choice. I really feel like I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just love I love this path that I've, I've taken. Um, and I really feel like this is me. And like I said, I just never looked back. And so then in my internship, I had uh, the privilege of, of working in a community mental health setting with a lot of play therapists. Not a lot of mm -hmm. interns get to experience that. Uh, and so I was very lucky, very fortunate to be in a setting where there were play therapies, therapists that were you know, very um, hands-on and they, you know, would teach me about sand trade therapy and, and all the different types of, of um, play therapy modalities. And so I, you know, I fell in love with play therapy through that, that organization, that agency. And yeah. And then, you know, I've had so many different jobs and I've worked in so many different settings. And uh, currently I do a lot of consultation work in different organizations and schools. I help run Minecraft groups mm -hmm. and Lego groups. And I really get to use that geek therapy, you know, and bridge that with, with psychology and, and well-being. And so again, it's just, it was just finding myself in college, <laughs> in grad school, figuring out what makes me happy, what I'm passionate about and following that passion that's led me here to my place of purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I always say it's a life of passion, purpose, and play is really how I, I try to, to live my life. And of course it wasn't an easy road. There's always obstacles to get to where you, you don't want to be, but um, yeah, that's how I got here. I, I guess it didn't take as long as I thought it was going to take, <laughs> but that's the short condensed version. <laughs> oh, and it's a, it's a beautiful story and it's your story and that's, what's important. And I think it also hits on something that I think we'll probably get into too. And as we talk about things further, that aspect of the ideal that's put forth by culture, family, and so forth. And yet the reality of to who we are, what we actually need, they can be, uh, they can go against each other. They can also work in tandem with each other. It's just right. figuring out where that is. Right. So that's the, the trickier part. But you mentioned this work you did with play therapy. Well, let's be frank. There's not a lot of necessary agencies or groups that are specifically also focused on play therapy. So why don't we help the audience understand what play therapy is? Absolutely. So as we we know, you know, play is a child's natural language, right? It's it's how they make sense of their world and their experiences. So in play therapy, the clients can express themselves in a way that's natural to them. And what it does is it allows the therapist to enter the child's world and communicate with the child at their level. And what's really important in play therapy is relationship. Relationship is such a core part of the process. And so in the presence of a caring 
and supportive therapist, that child, that client can feel safe enough to express their thoughts and feelings through toys and costumes and dance and movement and storytelling and all sorts of other materials. And what they essentially can do is act out the stories that they want to tell, you know, stories that might otherwise be difficult to verbalize because if we're looking at developmental, you know, Mm -hmm. not all children can just sit there and do talk therapy and express what's going on. And I want to make a really important note as I describe play therapy. And I mentioned children maybe a million times in that sentence that play therapy can also be used for adults. We are a strong believer that play therapy can be used with everybody. Play is universal and it reaches, you know, across the lifespan. Of course, we adults forget to play Mm -hmm. (laughs) as we get older and which is probably why it's so much more important to really hit home how important play is for development, um, that cathartic, you know, storytelling um, and just even developing skills and role playing and really just practicing is what I always say. So we're always practicing mm-hmm. real life through our play because even as adults, believe it or not, Perry, we also have a hard time expressing our thoughts and feelings. I know, I know, Perry, you don't, but <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of adults who do. And then in play therapy, we, Uh, use a concept called the therapeutic powers of play as a way to describe what happens in a play therapy session. So these can be seen as the inherent qualities in play therapy that can bring about change within the client. And so if you go to the Association for Play Therapy's website, you can read all about the therapeutic powers of play. There's 20 of them. They're in four categories and they, um, I can name some of the powers of play. Mm-hmm. You know, Communication is one, positive emotions, self-regulation. So you have self-expression. You have all these different powers of play that you're activating in a play therapy session. Right. Um, and so I really do recommend, uh, you know, for your listeners, if they're interested in play therapy or how to become a play therapist, because, you know, it, there is a process to it. You have to be licensed first and foremost, and then there are a certain number of clinical hours you have to attain in play therapy, uh, doing play therapy. In addition to courses you have to take, uh, you know, your continuing education. Mm-hmm. And so if they're interested, they can go to the Association for Play Therapy's uh, website for that. And I I use all sorts of different modalities of play therapy. There's sand tray play therapy. There's the digital aspect using video games. Uh, and so if anyone uh, is not familiar with sand tray play therapy, Perry, are you familiar with sand tray play therapy or do you yes. use it yourself? Yes. Okay. I, I, I did it was in my initial training, but I don't actually use it in my day-to-day practice. Yeah. yeah. Sanctuary therapy is like my heart. (laughs) And uh, it's funny because people always, when they hear my name, they think of video games and I'm like, well, Santre is really like the love of my life. And so for anyone who isn't familiar with Santre play therapy, what it does is it involves using sand and miniatures, objects from nature and water. And what it does, it allows the client to create a picture or a scene to reflect their inner experience. So basically it allows the client to communicate their thoughts and feelings without having to find the right words. And sand is used because it's thought of as cleansing healing, sacred, and grounding, but other mediums can be used as well. Not all all of our clients enjoy the touch of sand. We can use rice and beads and all sorts of other mediums um, as well. But Mm -hmm. sand tray is really just, oh, it's such a beautiful medium. And I, you know, have used it, like I said, across the lifespan. Adults love it to to the children. And it looks different across the lifespan as as Mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So I think a couple of interesting points there, and one that I know sort of comes to mind from what you said there is that aspect of starting with the, off with the idea that people understand what play is versus what it isn't. And that standpoint of realizing that this is a child's land, the way a child can speak to us in their language, let alone also adults. I kind of wonder about that struggle we have, especially as people of color, where that's been lost to us, especially those of us who live in Western world and so forth, as opposed to our home cultures and so forth, what the role play play is. 
what it is with our, with our kids and for our kids. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, non-Western cultures have very different attitudes of play. And I mean, and it's, you know, this is where it's, you know, c- culture is so complex. You know, you've met one Asian person, you've met one Asian person, you know, and I've worked with families, specifically refugees and immigrants. And so I, uh, it's, it's fascinating to, to, to explore what they think of play and how they see play. And in some cultures, you're right, you know, play can be seen as frivolous, right? Uh, so the parental perception of play is really an important factor, you know, when we're looking at cross-cultural contexts. Uh, so a lot of the uh, Chinese immigrant families I work with, uh, they some of them, I'm saying like if you've met one family, you've only met one mm-hmm. Chinese family, but you know, f- for the ones I've, you know, I've worked with, you know, their perception of play is that it is just for fun and it's relaxing and it's not really a learning activity. Uh, you know, whereas here in the West, you know, play is learning. You'll, you'll see that. I think mm-hmm. it's Mr. Rogers, isn't it? Mr. Rogers that mm-hmm. even said that play, uh, play is learning. And so what we'll often see the families I work with is they, they feel like too much play is a waste of time. And so what they'll do is they'll, um, really maximize academic learning time in the house as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, that's sort of like their mainstream way of teaching is, you know, no, we're going to read a book and learn. And, you know, this experiential learning in school is not enough. It's not enough. Mm-hmm. And so what they'll do is they'll try to compensate and they'll be, you know, more structured. There's tutoring. You know, I'm, I'm you know, even right now it's the summertime here. Mm-hmm. And so kids are on summer break and the clients I speak to, you know, they're just like, oh, my mom's making me do math <laughs> and, you know, all of this stuff. And, and it's because it is hard uh, you know, it's in a cultural sense, it's hard for them to to grasp, you know, that, you know, we can learn those same skills that we need in math, like spatial mapping, for example, in play. I can do that mm-hmm. in a game that I do in, in a Lego game that I do that hits on problem solving, creative uh, creativity, teamwork, spatial mapping, all the things you need for math we can do in a game, but it doesn't always mm-hmm. click. I don't know if you've experienced that, but oh, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. always like, it doesn't always click. So it is, um, it is very fascinating, but then in some other cultures, you know, like I said, you know, it's, it's so, it's so complex, but in some other cultures, of course, play is such an important part of the culture and um, it's such a community. Um, it's not individualistic, like here in the West, it's uh you know, the kids go out to play and they're with the whole village and they're playing Mm -hmm. together and um, the village is raising the kids together. You know, that mom knows whose kid is that, you know, where, where's, you know, so it's, oh, he's down the street, you know, everybody knows. Whereas here in the West, what a lot of the families I work with when they move to this country, they were surprised at how individualistic this country is and felt like play was more adult led than child led. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of play dates even is like Mm -hmm. a new concept to a lot of the families I work with. Like, what is this play date business? You know, (laughs) because it's so unintentional and spontaneous. Whereas here in the States, it's very different. We have very supervised spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you look at different, you know, it's it's so fascinating play across the cultures. Um, But yeah. And I, I would say I grew up in a household that, I, I, I mean, my parents worked really hard. They were barely home. So, I, I mean, I would say my brothers and I played video games all the time. They didn't really stop us. But, but I mean, I think they they thought it was a waste of time and they were very focused on our academics. And I don't mm. think they, I don't think they um, maybe got the concept that play is learning and they didn't connect those two ideas. I don't think, I think those were two separate things in their head. And that's how, you know, and like I said, it's it's so different in every culture and in every family. Right. And I know I look at that when looking at also the nature of especially for African American uh, children, equally when we start seeing the issues of when they get aged up faster than they actually are, mm-hmm. and how quickly the idea that just because a 10 year old happens to be 5'10 already, that somehow not only are they adult, they should be working as opposed to also playing. Yeah, they're going to be able to sink the basket a lot easier than some of their peers but there's still a 10-year-old who needs to play. 
Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, recently, because it is the summer, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about nature play. Mm -hmm. And this is a really fascinating topic for me and in the work that I'm doing and and currently in some research that I'm partaking in, uh, you know, people's perception of, okay, well, you know, outdoor play, you know, we we talk about the digital space and video games Mm -hmm. and screen time. And I know you've had conversations with other professionals on this as well. And uh, I don't think I'm going to get an argument from you that video games can be great. I think you're mm-hmm. probably on the same page as far as what video games can provide. But of course, I think we both also know that it is important to get outside as well. Mm-hmm. But th- this is something that I've been, you know, dealing with even just right now, currently. And I just had this conversation with a colleague just yesterday, but I am I'm currently working in a what's called a forest school. So I don't know. Are you mm-hmm. familiar with forest school? Perry? No, but I figure some variation on ecotherapy. Exactly. And so we're out in the forest and we're doing a lot of nature based expressive arts and play. We're going on hikes. And uh, so this organization brought me in to lead these groups to, to create this curriculum. Now, this area that I'm providing this nature play group is in a it's a, it's a wealthy area, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a suburb of Chicago. So it's a, it's a fairly wealthy area. And I do a lot of work, you know, all over Illinois, you know, got North side of Chicago, South side of Chicago, I'm all over the place. And so, you know, I was sitting here with a colleague thinking, how can we bring this forest school to the South side of Chicago? And we were talking about places and locations we could possibly hold these forest schools. And, We were just so frustrated, Perry, in the lack of green space in a lot of the areas where black and brown children live, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to talk about play, we have to talk about the role of race in that green space movement. This Mm -hmm. is like, this is something I'm very passionate about, especially as I sit trying to figure out where to host these, these forest schools for Southside kids and, um, you know, we have to really think about the inequalities and the privileges um, that exist because not everyone has access to those green spaces. And when we look at historically, you know, racism in housing practices and city planning, we see that those black and brown families are in areas that are very much nature deprived. And Mm -hmm. this is all stemming from redlining and I don't know if your you know audience you know is familiar with red lighting. I'm I'm happy to maybe briefly explore that. Um, Let's just, just go sort of give them a snippet. A snippet. So so red lighting is a, a form of segregation that was implemented by the federal government in the 1930s. And what had happened was the government, what they did is they rated neighborhoods on a scale from A to D um, to determine who got property loan disbursements and there's some other housing opportunities maybe parks and golf courses and all those sorts of privileges right and so as you could probably already guess uh the outcome was that the a rated communities were predominantly white and so those communities received a lot of support while the d rated communities were mainly black were excluded from all those supports and mm-hmm. you, know, you know the the parks and the preserves and all those things that we see. And so those impacts, like I had mentioned, are still seen today and mm-hmm. it directly contributes to the current wealth gap and environmental justices injustices, um, such as that limited park access that right now <laughs> I'm sitting here dealing with trying to figure out how do I bring the same level of enjoyment and playfulness into these communities? Um, because gosh, you know, Perry, if you think about parks and bike lanes and fresh air, all those things are taken for granted in these wealthier communities. And they're often disregarded in in these other communities. And so, you know, this is another, I don't know if this is another podcast episode, but gosh, I could just go into all of the social justice and what we need to do as clinicians as far as advocating for greener spaces in these communities and investing in park spaces because all of that can lead to social change and this conversation is all stemming from the fact that play mm-hmm. is important for everybody and so everybody should have access to playing outdoors and feeling safe to be outdoors because i think you know we also know 
but not everyone is in a position where they can be outside or feel safe due to the police or other factors. And mm-hmm. so these are things that when we're talking about play, especially in the play therapy community, I think they often get dismissed because a lot of people, quite frankly, are speaking from a place of privilege um, and they're not understanding, you know, that that cultural humility framework hasn't clicked for some of them. And I, you know, I deal with that a lot too in, in my field, uh, the play therapy community, um, you know, it can to be do lacking some more in- diverse, more diversity. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I can tell you, I can tell you just, it feels lonely. Sometimes I do have my, you know, nice community of clinicians that I lean on and we support each other, but it feels so darn lonely sometimes. And so if you're a listener out there and you're thinking of it going into mental health, gosh, look into play therapy. We need more. <laughs> we need more. Well, we need more diversity across the board in mental health, Yes, uh, being able to do shift these tones and also shift some of these things that are normalized additionally to that standpoint too what you're talking about about these redlined areas Mm -hmm. too equally if you looked at them too where is the uh jobs and it was much more generally much more industrial yeah so that also adds to that standpoint of where are these environments encouraging the idea of play versus work absolutely absolutely yeah (laughs) so I think that's a great place for to let that soak in for people and just to think about how these environments, these redlined areas, not just because of the economic standpoint of it, we're also sending messages about what is it, uh, where, where and what are we supposed to be doing with our time that is not quote unquote work based. How is it about setting places for us to play and especially for kids to grow into this? So Sing on. Let, let that sink in, folks. And we'll be back here on Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. I'm Barry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist, here with Sophie Ansari, licensed professional counselor. And we'll be back in a bit. Enjoying our shows and can't get enough of us? Follow us on Instagram at Voice America Talk Radio and see what we're cooking up for you. Our lives and the world around us can get messy and frustrating. Untangle and Grow Counseling's focus is to untangle that mess and make sense of it so you have a good foundation to build and grow from. Visit us on the web at untangleandgrowcounseling.com. Perry Clark offers individual psychotherapy, couples and family therapy, and adolescence therapy from a variety of coping materials and resources. Visit untangleandgrowcounseling.com for more information. Are you looking for life's answers? How about the meaning of true self? Can you really be a better person overnight? Well, good luck with that. Now, if you really want to know more about this insane world and life we lead, tune into Dr. Gary Bell's Absurd Psychology. You'll learn about how the brain operates under different psychological conditions. Some common sense. Heck, you might just actually learn something. Listen Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Empowerment. Tune in to the Voice America Variety Channel on the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Voice America Variety broadcasts a diverse array of topics, reaching a global community. Our experts come from all walks of life, and the topics they discuss are everything from current events, arts and entertainment, leadership, parenting, relationships, self-improvement, career advice, and a variety of other topics. Check us out today. You're sure to find something of interest. Voice America Variety. Talk on today's hot topics. You are listening to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. If you have a question or comment about our podcast, send an email to pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. That's pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. And now, back to the program. Hello, all. Welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. This is Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist, here with you. And I'm here with Sophie Ansari, licensed professional counselor. We've been talking about play therapy as well as, well, let's just be frank, the our diversity issues in also both in our field. So I'm curious, Sophie, uh, what is the path just for those who are already on their way in school to becoming 
uh, not just a therapist or a licensed professional counselor, but a play therapist specifically? Sure. So, you know, that's a great question because when we were in grad school, I don't know if play therapy was really discussed. I took a child and development course, but Mm -hmm. maybe that was as far. Did you take any play therapy or child development? I'm always curious. And and I remember there was ones talking about sand tray play and so forth, but not to the same degree and depth. I mean, there were some uh, continuing education classes on it, but not as really putting yeah. the, that that's where you could go. And yeah. then I was also looking at how many of my uh, peers were thinking, he's like, no, I want to want to work with adults. I don't want to work with families. Right. Yeah. No. And, and I think people think play therapy is only for children. And so a lot of them will just completely discount obtaining it. So I'll do my, to the best of my regulation and, and, and ability of the standards and criteria, but an overall view. And again, you can go to the Association for Play Therapies website for more detailed on the number of hours. I always get those things confused. But generally what what the path after graduating high school is you, you know, you go to college and you obtain a a bachelor's, or some mm-hmm. people might start with an associates and go into a bachelor's. And you know, really it's you know, like I even mentioned my, my degree wasn't mental health related. I went to biology and some people go into other fields that are unrelated mm-hmm. to, to mental health. Perry, your degree was in, what was uh, it? Creative arts. Creative so arts. Okay. An art major. So, so you're an art major. So, uh, you know, we can have different paths in, in undergrad, but, uh, you really want to pursue after getting that bachelor's a degree in mental health, you know, a mental health related mm-hmm. graduate degree. So that would be a master's degree. And typically they're about two year programs. I know maybe some would be shorter. I'm not, I'm not sure depending on where you're at in country, but I think mine was a two year master's program. Mm-hmm. And during those two years, there is a period of time where you're doing an internship or some people call it clinical residency. And you're basically, in the field, right? And so you're Mm -hmm. doing counseling, uh, whether in an office or in the school, you know, there's, you know, therapy happens in a variety Mm -hmm. of settings. You can be in prisons, you can be, Mm -hmm. gosh, there's so many places that you could be offering therapy and you're accruing those hours uh, so that you can get your license. And I think even before then you've got to take, or even during grad school, before you graduate, you've got to take a some sort of an exam or a competency exam, and you have to pass that as well to get your graduate degree. But you're doing all of this at the same time. You're you're studying for this competency exam, and you're also accruing these clinical hours. And then when all is said and done, you sit for a licensing exam, mm-hmm. and um, and then you know you hopefully pass, and then you're you've got your your license, and then you are considered, you're not an independently licensed clinician, meaning you will need the supervision of someone who's independent because you're still learning as a clinician. And so a supervisor is someone who is there to assist you and help you with clinical concerns and decisions and reviewing your paperwork and really just sort of you know, finessing and helping you really develop your skills as a clinician. I think it's gosh, it's such an important piece of our work is having supervision and having someone to refer to. Um, a lot of the times our supervisors become, you know, our mentors, right? And mm-hmm. they they can teach us so much. And so you'll be under a supervisor, I, I think for a certain number of clinical hours, and it always it's always different. I never can remember. And once you um, are done with those hours, you apply this is what how the path was for me as a um, licensed professional clinical counselor. I then had to sit for, I believe, did I have, oh no, I didn't have to sit for an exam. I don't think there's another exam, right, Perry? I think it's just, they sign off and then you send it to the board. I think that's it. I don't remember, but. Well, <laughs> depends on, depends depends. on location, because I know in yeah. California you've got, you got to get the past the license, the um, law and ethics exam, and you've got also yeah. the uh, actual licensing exam. And I don't know if Illinois also has to deal with the national exam. So California does it because it has its own. So it's like there's some, uh, but in broad sense, you got to get your master's and then you can start looking at becoming a little more specialized. You can become a little more specialized. Exactly. And so, 
you know, when, for me, when I was doing that supervised clinical hours, I was doing play therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was accruing play therapy hours because you need a certain number of play therapy hours to become a registered play therapist. So during my entire internship, and then also during my supervised time, I was accruing all those clinical hours. It must've been Mm -hmm. 3000 plus hours. And then during that time, I was also getting my continuing education courses. And there's a certain number of courses. I think it's 150 hours of courses. And there are specific courses you have to take. Uh, cultural diversity is is an area, a topic that you have to you have to take courses in, which I think that's great that they make mm-hmm. that, that requirement. Uh, and then there's history, there's theories. Theories are so important. And then, yeah, so then you, you do all these. And once you've done your hours, once you've done your education, then you, uh, you can apply to become a registered play therapist. And then, you know, that just gives you more, you know, I guess, you know, credential wise, it says, Hey, I am someone who studied play therapy and theory and can apply it across the lifespan. And, you know, and I've used my registered play therapy, you know, my, the letters after my name, it's been really helpful in terms of even just teaching because I teach Mm -hmm. a lot of play therapy. I own let's play therapy Institute where we we teach mental health clinicians, Mm -hmm. how to do play therapy. So it's been a, a great, Uh, For me, it's been great. It's opened up a lot of opportunities and a lot of doors. And the really great thing is outside organizations, not even related to mental health, they find it fascinating. Like, well, you're a play therapist? Tell me more. And so then these other companies like Minecraft Education, for example, will ask me to come in and teach them about the science behind play Mm -hmm. and then integrate it with whatever they're doing with educators. Um, And so it's really opened up a lot of avenues. And so, like I had mentioned, you know, there's all these requirements and, you know, there's a path to it, but after you've sort of hit the the check mark of, you know, the list of, you know, things and items that you have to complete um, it's well worth it. And I think, uh, you know, the learning never stops. And that's something, you know, as a registered play therapist and as even just a Mm -hmm. licensed professional, you have to keep taking those continuing education classes, Mm -hmm. keep your license. And so in play therapy, it's the same thing. So throughout the year, I'm still taking classes. I'm still learning. There's new things coming out. You know, we're learning more about using video games and therapy and D and D and tabletop games Mm -hmm. and therapy and all these um, different modalities and Lego and so um, it's an exciting field uh, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's just been so beautiful across cultures, across you know, lifespan. Um, it's just, uh, I, I can see it's, it's, it's been, it's been, you know, like I guess it's been life changing for me because it also reminds me I need more play in my life, you know, and it <laughs> says, okay, Sophia, you're, you're preaching it, but practice it. So I really do hope your listeners, for those who are interested you know, do delve into it and learn more about it. Uh, And, you know, it's just such a fulfilling career for sure. Well, and equally too, what you've also revealed in that too, is the aspect of you can not, you don't just have to be a licensed professional therapist. You can also be able to create your own businesses. Yes, absolutely. And we're not just limited to private practice. You can create this organization that's nonprofit, that's supporting others in these other fields. And I can I can't even begin to imagine how the play therapy you bring has been useful in the refugee situations you've worked with too. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean we've we use storytelling and movement and dance, you know, to to tell stories and for a lot of the different cultures that I've worked with, the Afghanistan refugees, um Syria, Palestinian, uh, I've like learned so much through how they celebrate and play and They've taught me dances and even Mm -hmm. cooking. I mean, cooking might not seem like play, but cooking can be play, you know, Mm -hmm, and just mm -hmm. cooking together and learning, just being so deeply attuned and, you know, ingrained in this, you know, this culture of collectivism, it's just this whole, and it's just so beautiful. Um, You know, every culture celebrates and plays differently and there's no wrong way to play. You know, we, we say this so much when we're working with neurodivergent clients, you know, where, you know, some, some might say, well, 
that play is a little peculiar. You might, you know, hear that from some parents. Mm -hmm. And we always remind our parents that, gosh, there's no wrong way to play, right? Um, We play for the sake of playing and uh, it's going to bring you joy, right? And along the road, you also do some learning. So it's twofold in its benefits, but uh, yeah, it's been a really beautiful experience and working with refugees and not, you know, even using comic books like Miss Marvel being a Muslim superhero and then mm-hmm. working with Muslim refugees has been so beautiful. And these kids are like, wait, that superhero looks like me, you know, mm-hmm. growing up with Superman and Batman and then looking at Miss Marvel and saying, oh, she has the same skin color as me. I mean, these kids, they're, they're just so tickled by it. And, uh, and we use those comic books and music and storytelling to help them explore their own thoughts and feelings and it creates this really safe space. And so that's why geek therapy has been such a, a beautiful lens for me as a play therapist. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that, as we transition over to our geekdom, I uh, very much enjoyed watching Miss Marvel. And I also remember the scene that was in a moonlight where um, uh, after I'm, I'm blanking on her character's name is in her, um, her avatar suit mm-hmm. and rescues the family from the, the the uh van the girl says are you an egyptian superhero mm, yeah yeah i know i love that that, that was a beautiful scene oh. in that standpoint and just also gets back into the some of the bigger issues we have on the idea that superheroes only can be in the u.s and yes, yes. there's superheroes around the world a lot, there's an indian spider-man and oh, yeah i mean so into the spider-verse i just <laughs> yes. saw this last week oh i have to watch soon- it still <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're gonna <laughs> love that scene. I when they can't come wait. Up. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Uh, you know, yeah, and 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 people, yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, the very first superhero ever was Egyptian, and of course, her mm-hmm. name is slipping my mind. But if you look at the the history and the text, that was a very first superhero. Um, and Isis. so I don't remember. And of course, hmm. we talked about it on Hero Nation, and of course, that was so long ago, but. Um, yeah, so people, yeah, superheroes are all over the world. And, uh, you know, I am South Asian, so I grew up on Bollywood and mm-hmm. you know, we had some really cool superhero movies, you know, and, mm-hmm. and sci-fi and all these things. So it's not just a Western, you know, concept. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which also gets into the issue of not only the, uh, archetypes of the characters that are in there, but even what the story focuses are, because yes. I remember all the difficulties that was happening with, um, Pacific Rim when it was both the Pacific Rim movies. And then, um, the final fantasy spirits within when it first came out and the difficulties they were having with people recognizing them while looking at that. And it's like, no, they're playing to the tropes that are culturally appropriate over here as opposed to the western tropes and if you don't understand that difference okay no wonder you're not enjoying this as much because you're actually having to work at understanding there are other ways that these tropes play themselves out these character archetypes absolutely absolutely yeah that's why i i know you use geek therapy in your work so you're using these different characters and storylines you're probably using Mm -hmm. anime right and comic Mm -hmm. books and tv shows in your work uh, and you're um, assuming you're picking, you know, clients are bringing these up in, in session and then mm-hmm. you're always tying it back to their experience. So um, if for anyone who's not familiar with geek therapy, you know, I can briefly define it as really a strengths based model that really builds mm-hmm. on the the positive and rewarding parts of a person's life to solve problems. And really at its foundation, it's about connection. And didn't I just, you know, say with play therapy, that's all about the relationship. And mm-hmm. so... I'm sure you found this, Perry, is, you know, if you ask a a child or, you know, a client, adult client about an interest of theirs, like Mm D&D, and if you really, you're a gamer, (laughs) so if you, you know, try to really listen and understand their world, I'm sure you've seen that they begin to explore and open up about deeper issues and actually get excited about coming to therapy, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Because they're like, oh, we gets it. Yeah. yeah, And that some of these other stories become the analogy that they can actually parse to it. And I remember uh, at some points during during my training period, I was saying that to therapists is the stories like that you're finding in Gears of War or Resident Evil or the dealing with Spider-Man and so forth. These are the stories of now. We're dealing with a much broader 
base of stories to be able to pull from rather than just the Disney and the grim fairy tales, which I also find, I think, too, is an aspect of where we're seeing a a struggle and shift of age of who the therapist is, as opposed to for some therapists are being their second, maybe third careers, yeah, as opposed to first careers for some. And so there's that, where is their age base and uh, access to being able to normalize that as a factor, and especially with working with kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's a mindset, right? And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's, um, it's about, I think the mindset that we all go into as therapists, hopefully, is that we believe that the client is the expert of their own lives, right? Mm-hmm. And so for them to share the stories that they connect with and resonate with, and then using that as this filter of fiction. Uh, I think Travis, Dr. Travis Langley always says, I always love that the mm-hmm. filter of fiction <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and, and using that to create that safe space, that safe distance. Um, gosh, it's such a beautiful framework, I think, for allowing us to process our own experiences and gain perspective, uh, you know, talking about Miss Marvel's problems can feel mm-hmm. safer than talking about our own problems, you mm-hmm. know, and so a client, you know, we'll talk about Kamala Khan's problems and then, you know, we'll try to parallel that to their own mm-hmm. experiences and we'll watch how these characters manage their feelings. And then ultimately we'll learn how to equip ourselves Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, geek therapy is such a beautiful marriage. I think it plays so beautifully with play therapy. Right. And then I can bring in, uh, we'll do magic tricks or we'll talk about Harry Potter or mm-hmm. we'll, you know, there's just, it's so dynamic and engaging and immersive. Um, you know, we'll do uh, with Pokemon we'll create our own Pokemon, or, you know, I'll hide Pokemon in the office and they've got to catch them all, mm-hmm. you know, and it's that movement and storytelling. Um, so if you are already, you know, someone who understands the importance of pop culture, then gosh, then play therapy. And that is just, like I said, it's a beautiful marriage. <laughs> so no, it's nice to hop, skip and jump yeah, away. Yeah. Because I know one of the things I've uh, used in a number of clients is uh, talking about from Star Trek, the Kobayashi Maru test. Yeah. And what that actually means and what it actually uh, in for, especially for the adults that I've talked about it with, it is starting to realize is that, yeah, they don't always, there is not always going to be a win condition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's so true. Yeah. There's, there's so much exploration to be done for, you know, just the, the characters. I, the, uh, I think it was last week I had a caregiver who was really concerned about her child really liking the bad guys <laughs> mm-hmm. and then, you know, Star Wars and all these, uh, and I love Darth Vader. So I don't know. You can analyze me all you want, but I've always been the dark side girl, but, um, <laughs> and you know, it was fascinating to have this conversation about that through the lens of, of villains and storytelling and mm-hmm. reminding the caregiver that, you know, your child doesn't like the bad guys because the bad guys are evil. They like the bad guys because the bad guys are powerful. And, mm-hmm. you know, villains can be this outlet to make people, you know, children, adults feel less helpless. Uh, and so I'm always, you know, trying to remind everyone, you know, whether it be in in workshops or in sessions that play and real violence are two different things. Mm-hmm. So if you have a client that loves the the villains, then, you know, it just might be a sign that they just feel powerless then, and, and then they might need a little bit more autonomy. So then we work with the caregivers. How do we help that child feel more powerful? And how do we, you know, help them experience that power of that superhero or super villain uh, persona? So, um, and it's just, it's, it's so fascinating. The, the conversations where, you know, it's always, you know, Oh, will they grow up to be bad. Will they grow up? And that's sort of the hand in hand with the video games and violence, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and we know, of course, research, you know, will tell us time and time again, there's no correlation between the two, but um, I work with a lot of adolescents and a lot of adolescents will be drawn to dark mm-hmm. elements and dark shows and anime, and that can be concerning. And so, I mean, if we look at adolescence, that's a time in their life that they're exploring pain, isn't it? Don't you remember mm-hmm. being an adolescent and well, kind of really it, understanding pain? Well, not just exploring pain. There's also the aspect of it's part of the 
as the, and I saying this during an IAP meeting, we all have to learn to lie at some point. Mm, absolutely. Because we can't live in this world without some degree of lying. I mean, we put this great virtuism around truth, but let's be right. frank, to right. survive in the world, we okay lying. That's absolutely, yeah. No, that's, and I mean... the purpose of that lying. So it's also that struggle too, where we're shifting from the black and white thinking into the gray and then realizing there's a lot more gray going on than just pure black and white. Absolutely. See, that's the beauty of free therapy. <laughs> that is the abs- absolute beauty of it is that these, these darker themes provide language and context to their internal experience. And, you know, we should be able to, to support that youth instead of, mm-hmm. you know, pathologizing it, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, some people prefer, I don't know, seeking out movies and video games that have themes of depression because it helps them feel validated, right? And then other people seek out things like Animal Crossing when they're feeling depressed because they don't want to be reminded of their depression. I mean, it just, it's mm-hmm. like so different for, you know, the different types of media we consume and the reasons we consume it. And like you just said, it's not black and white, gosh. It's just, the, it's a spectrum of reasons we're drawn to certain themes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I can't do the scary games because I have a lot of anxiety, so mm-hmm. I don't need that in my life. So I'll be playing Animal Crossing and decorating my bedroom over here in Animal Crossing. But if a child chooses to to play Call of Duty or whatever it is, then we're always, you know, asking what's what need is it meeting? Mm-hmm. And so um, that's why, like, again, I just I, I love being able to integrate a child's interests. I really do. I, when I was a kid, I was in therapy. I was seeing a therapist and they dismissed all of my interests. Like they Mm. would just roll their eyes. They thought it was just, you know, they didn't want to get to know me. And I remember that feeling. Oh my gosh. I remember it after all these years. And I, you know, I had anxiety since I was a kid. And so I just thought, well, it would have been so powerful and useful just to have someone to listen and be accepting of my of my interests in comic oh, yeah. books or, you know, gosh. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I vowed to not be that therapist. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I get to exactly what you're saying. I actually just had a client this morning mm-hmm. who, as he said, he was worried about having coming to therapy and it's a man uh, and a black man because he's never, never worked with a black therapist. Mm-hmm. And then as they had walked in, it's like, wait a minute, we've seen each other at this other event. I recognized him. He didn't recognize me. And it was that standpoint, it's like, okay, we, we do have a shared language and so forth. And it made him much more relaxed in the fact that, yeah, he could be here to talk. Now, this was an adult as opposed to a kid, but that sense of not recognizing these things doesn't build relationship. Right. Absolutely. Relationship is what it's all about. That's that's the core. Yeah. Uh, you know, no matter what your theoretical orientation is relationship is, is that piece. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, absolutely that connection. And so, and you know, th- I, you know, people always ask, how do you keep up with all the movies and video games? I don't, there's no way I can watch everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure, you, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 There's just fine. Find what your, what your fandom and stuff is. You follow it. You may have some peripheral awareness of those items as the things I was saying to some of my uh, colleagues back when I was in training, it's like YouTube is your friend. Yeah. When you, you got a kid that's got an interest in something that you don't particularly know, go on to YouTube and we'll play, do playthrough or walkthrough of whatever that game or universe is. Look at Wikipedia for what some information is about that world. As long as you have that base primer, yeah. you can let the kid teach you the rest of it. And there it becomes that aspect too, where the idea of being able to let go and let this kid be a teacher to you. Through this play is something that is uncomfortable, even sadly for those in our field, which then I would also recommend, are you getting your own work done around this issue? And is this the right type of client you should be seeing? Absolutely. No, that's, that's being within your scope and you, you know, make a great point, you know, that the, the client being the teacher, this happens in video games all the time. Mm -hmm. We'll have a lot of clinicians who are very apprehensive about going into Roblox thinking, Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to play Roblox. I don't know where I'm at half the time. And we say, it's okay. Trust the process. You know, the, the client just thrives over being able to say, Hey, Miss Sophia, it's okay. I got you. Just follow mm-hmm. me, Miss Sophia. It'll be okay. You know, and it gives them that sense of agency. 
uh, mm-hmm. and, and mastery and control. And so um, absolutely, I think uh, always practice within your scope. And then um, in addition to that, you get training. And uh, in, in addition to that, you understand why you're doing what you're doing. That's the the really important piece is why are you doing what you're doing? And we talk about this all the time in video games and uh, working with parents in video games and you know, that we're picking games based on the needs and the therapeutic goals of the client. uh, And uh, gosh, there's so much you can do in that digital space. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just, I I grew up on video games. I'm sure Perry, you Mm -hmm. did too. I mean, gosh. (laughs) Yeah. So it's just a a great way, another way of playing. And it was probably the only time my brothers and I actually got along. So (laughs) So there's more relationship building, family bonding. How that looks is not just always going to be the at the dinner table. It can be these all these other moments. Exactly. So I want to thank you again for coming on and doing this episode here with us. And where can folks find you if they want to find out more? Thank you, Perry, for having me. It was such a privilege. Um, yeah, they can find me at letsplaytherapy.org. Again, it's letsplaytherapy.org, and that's the Let's Play Therapy Institute. And we provide trainings to mental health professionals on the therapeutic power of play. And we have uh, a lot of trainings on video games specifically, but we've talked about D&D and we've got Lego and telehealth. And so if it's about play, we're talking about it. So I hope everyone gets a chance to check out our website. And if you're a clinician to check out our trainings as well. Perfect. So we'll have those as many of those notes in our uh, show notes as possible. So you can check it out, but otherwise folks, I hope you have a good weekend and well, frankly, go play. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in for Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. Be sure to join your host, Perry Clark, for another episode on the podcast coming soon on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. 